the cloud. Uh, so if I have a hybrid cloud that I can keep some sensitive data and applications, it use the sensitive data in the private cloud and uh, less sensitive data in the public cloud. Uh, then the second thing, of course, is if you look at public clouds like Amazon, the scalability is much, much higher than that of private clouds. I mean, very few enterprises can afford to have the scale of data centers that Amazon has. A greater geographical reach. So if you take a look at Amazon, the public cloud, again, I'm using that as an example simply because they're very dominant. Uh, they are uh, available worldwide. They have content delivery networks and caching systems and so on, so it is available worldwide. And so because of that, they have a much greater geographical reach. Uh, then another advantage, of course, is that with the hybrid cloud, you can preserve legacy systems. Uh, so most enterprises, uh, they'll have some old applications they build using old technologies. If you want to jump completely to public cloud, uh, then what would happen is that you have to migrate, you have to change all of those applications. And I think this is the single most uh, uh, important reason. In fact, uh, uh, there, this is a, a very important reason in cloud computing today. Uh, so if you take a look at uh, the popularity of things like uh, Amazon, <clears throat> they are predominantly infrastructure as a service providers. And you may think, well, why isn't something like platform as a service or why isn't your software as a service getting as much traction? And I think this is the answer. There are many legacy systems. You take, for example, Google App Engine. Uh, they support just a few, they support four languages. Uh, they support Python, they support Ruby, um, and uh, Go, and uh, one more language, I think Java. So they support those four languages. So if you have an application that is written in one of those four languages, then you can use Google App Engine. But if you don't have an application that's written in those languages, uh, then you have to use something else. And so this legacy system, so basically if you have a hybrid cloud, uh, some of your applications can be running in your data center, the legacy applications, and what are the new applications you have, you can move them to the cloud. So this is a very important factor today in cloud systems. And of course this implies what I said, that the incremental migration. So if I have a hybrid cloud, I don't have to move everything to the public cloud at once. Suppose I'm decided that I want to be heavily in public cloud. I can have some of the stuff in private cloud and some of the stuff in public cloud. So that is the reason why hybrid clouds have a lot of traction nowadays. Uh, so if this is from a paper, there are four basically different types. If I look at it from an architecture point of view, uh, there are four different kinds of uh, hybrid clouds that they may have. Uh, so one of them is, and this is the most predominant model, here is the corporate cloud or enterprise cloud, uh, which has its own cloud. Like this might be, for example, OpenStack or something. And then over here, uh, this is the sort of like the controller, and this uh, gets resources from public clouds as and when they need. And that is the state of the uh, you know technology today. Uh, basically, people have found, and most of the vendors like HP and IBM, uh, they are saying that if you want cloud, you don't have to take all your hardware which you have and throw it away. Uh, for example, HP has what's called cloud system, and with the cloud system, if you install that in the existing hardware, that converts it into cloud. So this is the current situation, the most predominant one over here. There's another kind which is over here, where you have a broker, and through that broker, you can go to multiple public clouds. Uh, so this is more, uh, this is, uh, all the other three are experimental things. Uh, so many of the, uh, what do you call it, uh, research papers have talked about this. And this is sort of like the architecture of a platform as a service system. And if you take a look at something like Cloud Foundry, uh, then it can have this architecture. And the third one is where you've got multiple, so these are cloud federation kind of things. Uh, you've got multiple clouds which are owned by uh, different owners and, and they interoperate together. And on the other hand, uh, multi-tier where you have uh, you know, a central controller, but the whole thing is one cloud. Uh, so this also is an architecture that's widely found today. Uh, so after this abstract survey of kind of architectures, I'll go over, first of all, what are the commercially available kind of solutions today, and some research work that we're doing at PES University to try and uh, add hybrid features to OpenStack. Uh, so the first kind of thing is API level integration, where I have some tools that will work with different clouds, and then I can write a hybrid cloud system using that. So the first example of that is something called Delta Cloud. This was originally generated, this was originally from Red Hat, uh, but now it has been, it become, Red Hat donated it to Apache and has become a top level Apache product. 
sir, the, the Delta Cloud on the back end, it interfaces to a lot of things. As you can see, Amazon is there, and uh, so is OpenStack, and uh, DigitalOcean. It also uh, interfaces to Nebula, IBM Cloud, Rackspace. It interfaces to a lot of clouds. So in the front end, what happens is you have a client, and this client is like the management, the front end, the management GUI for this. And this can, this can be a web browser. Delta Cloud itself has a client. You can write your own client. So, but basically, there's a REST API that has to be able to make the HTTP REST with this. Uh, so what it does is it, the, the client will make REST requests to a Delta Cloud server, which can be running in your own, in, on some server somewhere. And then the back end, it makes requests to all these APIs. So that is the Delta Cloud approach. So for example, so suppose you, you can write an application which will say monitor the, uh, if suppose you're connected on the back end to two clouds, say Amazon and Rackspace, and uh, you can write some application to monitor the load, and it, depending on you know where the load is higher, spawn an instance and so on. So, so this is how Delta Cloud works. Then another uh, way of doing this, and so, so Amazon kind of occupies a special place because in public cloud they're very dominant. They have, I think, about 80% market share. Uh, so because of that, many cloud systems like OpenStack, they support an Amazon API, EC2 API. And so what happens is you can write a client which does, which does EC2 requests. Uh, suppose this is a private cloud which is running OpenStack and this is, a, this is Amazon. You can write your own private client, uh, which uh, makes requests to both, and you know have a hybrid cloud that way. And there are a number of tools which are which are available for that. There's Yuka tools, which is a CLI for EC2. Uh, then there's Hybrid Fox, is a Firefox add-on. There is Boton, which is Boto, which is a Python API. Uh, so, for example, in the case of Boto, what you can do is uh, you can uh, issue native OpenStack. You can use the uh, Python API to make uh, command both here and here. And there is Fog. Fog has a Ruby API to EC2 as well as to OpenStack. So there are a number of tools which will allow you to uh, do hybrid clouds between, say, OpenStack and others, and which taking advantage of the EC2 support. So now the uh, risk with this approach is the support may be deprecated. Uh, so originally, OpenStack was, uh, you know, more fully supporting the EC2 API. Uh, if you read the documentation that has come with the latest version of OpenStack, it's grizzly, uh, it says that EC2 API is to be used for migrating from Amazon. So they're gradually deprecating the use of that, and so there may be a time when it's not as supported as uh, you know the rest of the API. So that's the only danger of using that. Uh, then there are some com vendors have given some commercial hybrid solutions. Uh, so again, this is not intended to be an exhaustive survey. I'll just put down what I think are the uh, important ones. Uh, so IBM has a hybrid cloud solution. And the way this works in the case of IBM, this is why are the hybrid cloud extensions to Tivoli Manager. Uh, so IBM's hybrid cloud solution allows you to interface with uh, EC2, that is Amazon, and also with Salesforce.com. And so in the enterprise, there are, uh, there are, uh, there's a monitoring piece uh, which will, as part of the hybrid cloud extension, there's a monitoring software which will allow you to monitor EC2 uh, instances as well as what's in IBM as well. And similarly, if you want to create a VM, so provisioning and so on, is like creating VMs, creating virtual storage. Uh, so there is another module which will interface between the IBM cloud and EC2. So you can create VMs on EC2, et cetera, et cetera, for, app, for applications. And then there is a third piece which uses LDAP to uh, interface with Amazon security. So the security piece is also there. And then for data integration, they've got data integration with Salesforce uh, through uh, acquisition they made called Castile. So there's a data syncing technology, and it helps to keep data in the internal IBM cloud consistent with the uh, data in Salesforce. So this is the IBM hybrid cloud solution. Uh, then if you take a look at VMware hybrid cloud, uh, so the, the, the VMware also has a, a solution uh, which doesn't uh, it, you know, provide an uh, OpenStack API. Uh, but the hybrid cloud <laughs> solution that they are uh, taking has a slightly different approach from IBM's. Uh, so what VMware does is, if you have a private, here's your private cloud running VMware, 
and it's based on a technology called Geek Power. Now, VMware has made ag uh, uh, agreements with a number of uh, uh, public cloud providers to use the same vCloud technology. So I've just shown three of them over here as an example. There's Singapore Telecom, there's NTT, and there's NYSC, which is the IT arm of the New York Stock Exchange. So these are three, but if you go to VMware's uh, website, uh, you'll see that there are easily about 40 or 50 uh, providers that are there, and we are doing public cloud using the vCloud technology. And if you are running a VMware cloud, then the vCloud technology here integrates with the vCloud technology over there uh, to give a hybrid cloud. So this does not ex uh, integrate with Amazon. And uh, uh, so the, the, uh, the, uh, this does not integrate with Amazon. Uh, and as I said, another point that is possible is, which I haven't shown, is that VMware also has an OpenStack API. Uh, so using the OpenStack API, you can integrate uh, not necessarily to Amazon, but maybe with uh, with other open platforms. Uh, then there is the company called Eucalyptus, and Eucalyptus also has a hybrid cloud technology. So Eucalyptus is a private cloud. It's a software which you can download and use uh, by Eucalyptus Inc. And it originally came from uh, University of California. And uh, what the, uh, Eucalyptus is designed to be API compatible <coughs> with Amazon EC2. Uh, so all the API that Amazon supports, Eucalyptus also supports. Uh, so Eucalyptus also comes with what they call a hybrid user console. Uh, this talks to all the Amazon services, all the EC, EC2 services, uh, Eucalyptus services. Uh, so for example, uh, the, uh, the Amazon service EC2, which is VM management, there's a Eucalyptus service called a cloud controller, which is the equivalent. And then for S3, Amazon Simple Storage Service, the, the, the Eucalyptus, corresponding Eucalyptus thing is called the Volume Service. And EBS Storage, uh, Elastic Block Store of Amazon, uh, that corresponds to storage controller in Eucalyptus, and so on. So all this hybrid user console, which is part of Eucalyptus, uh, this can uh, stop to both AWS as well as e Eucalyptus. So there is a lot of... Uh, you know, you can create hybrid clouds and you can have some servers here, some servers here, have connections, etc. between them. Uh, so that is the Eucalyptus approach. Uh, <coughs> then, uh, so Amazon, so then the, uh, Amazon is of course the major public cloud uh, uh, provider, uh, but there's also Rackspace. So Rackspace has, is, uh, as you know, OpenStack has a lot of traction nowadays in the cloud community. And Rackspace is the dominant uh, vendor of OpenStack public clouds. Uh, so Rackspace is a public service pro cloud provider just like Amazon, uh, but they're based on OpenStack. And Rackspace also has some interesting uh, features. Uh, so what Rackspace does is they provide federation between any private cloud running OpenStack and a Rackspace cloud. Uh, so if you have, if you are using a private cloud, so for example, HP, you can download OpenStack from the OpenStack site. There are vendors like Red Hat and so on, which uh, which distribute OpenStack. And so if you are running a private cloud to OpenStack, then using what uh, Rackspace called the Rack Connect technology, you can connect to the Rackspace public cloud. Now Rackspace has an interesting feature, and that is that uh, which is intended to try and. Uh, uh, reduce some of the security concerns that people have. Uh, so in the Rackspace public cloud, you can have dedicated hosting or shared hosting. And shared hosting is very similar to the kind of uh, technology that people like Amazon have, in that you know the VM which you are running, virtual server, it can be on any physical server. But you can also have dedicated hosting. In dedicated hosting, the physical server, disks, etc., on which your uh, public cloud is running, uh, that is dedicated only to you. So nobody else has access to that. So that in Rackspace, you can, for more critical data, uh, you can, for, so for data, data is more critical, uh, you can use dedicated hosting. So the reason for this is that if you take a look at shared hosting, uh, you will be, your process, VM may be running on physical server one, and other people's VM may be running on physical server two. Uh, now, even though virtualization is a very secure technology, there are ways to hack uh, into the virtualization technology. Uh, if you just Google on the web, you'll find uh, articles like how to hack KVM, how to hack Zen, and so on and so forth. So no virtualization technology is 100% secure. 
so in a shared hosting, if it so happens, unfortunately, that your virtual machine is running on the same virtual machine as a hacker, it's possible that the hacker may hack into your virtual machine and find out something. Uh, here, on the other hand, dedicated hosting, even the physical resources are separate. Uh, so nobody can be using the same physical resources that you are using in terms of service. So you mean to say dedicated hosting here is more secure? It is more secure, yes. Yeah, yeah. So again, this is a evolving technology that is very controversial. You will have people who say it's not and so on and so forth. So I am just telling you that this is an option by Rackspace to do it. And uh, yeah. Uh, then there is EMC, which has their hybrid cloud thing, and this is in a way similar to uh, what uh, VMware has done. Uh, so they defined a technology called vBlock, and vBlock is an integrated infra that is an integrated set of processors, disks, and so on uh, from Cisco, VMware, and EMC. So Cisco supposed to supply the networking, and through their UCS, they supply the servers. Uh, VMware supplies for the virtualization technology, and EMC of course supplies the storage. So they have the vBlock technology, and you can build private clouds using the vBlock technology. And just like VMware, EMC also has a large list of uh, service providers who use the vBlock technology to provide a public cloud service. And if you have a private cloud built using vBlock, you can federate it with uh, So to give you an example, over here, at and is a service provider for EMC, EMC cloud. And uh, uh, for example, they, they, can, they can offer a storage or a service uh, offering which integrates with EMC cloud. And if you take a look at Canopy, uh, Canopy can uh, offer virtual desktop as a service. So if you are interested in having virtual desktop as a service in the public cloud, uh, and you have an EMC private cloud, you could get the virtual desktop as a service from Canopy, and then your private cloud will run in EMC. Uh, so there are other features too, like CSC offers information security and compliance from RSA and so on. And so forth. Uh, so this is the uh, EMC hybrid cloud uh, strategy. I now talked about some research that we're doing, a research effort that we're doing in uh, PES University uh, to try and build a hybrid cloud. And this we're working, this is we're trying to add hybrid cloud features to OpenStack. Uh, work has been funded by EMC, uh, and we're uh, talking to OpenStack team to try to make this a feature standard OpenStack. Uh, so. Uh, so we have two proposals actually, one is a federated cloud proposal and the second is a federated security proposal. Uh, so we have bro prototyped both of these and we are uh, sharing the design and the code with the OpenStack team uh, in the hope that they will accept it uh, as part of the current OpenStack. So first I talk about the OpenStack, the cloud federation part. As I said the two pieces of it, how do you federate the security and second how do you actually federate the cloud itself. Uh, so before I get into the federation, I'll just give a brief overview of OpenStack for those people uh, who are not familiar with it. Uh, so OpenStack is actually a collection of services. Uh, so there is a dashboard which is called Horizon, and that is the GUI, the graphical user interface. Uh, the compute piece is, which we'll talk mostly about is called Nova. Uh, then there is a block storage piece which is called Cinder, and the networking piece which is now called Neutron, and used to be called Quantum. Uh, there was a copyright issue with calling it quantum, it's now it's called neutron. There's an image service called Glance, object store which the gentleman earlier was talking about from Seagate uh, called Swift. And then there's Keystone, it's a security piece. So I'll talk about the security piece in the second part of it. Uh, so for the, for, the high, for the two proposals, so one of them was to actually federate the uh, clouds and the second is the sec federated security. For the federated security piece, we made modifications to Keystone. Uh, for the federated cloud piece, we made modifications to NOVA, which is the, uh, NOVA is the piece that creates and deletes VMs and so on and so forth. Uh, so briefly, what we've implemented is if you have an OpenStack private cloud and the public cloud is either OpenStack or Amazon, uh, then you can federate between these two. You can create a hybrid cloud of these two. Uh, so the design guideline we had is uh, we are extending the capability of the primary cloud. Uh, so we are not assuming that uh, what we're saying is that we don't want to assume, for example, that Amazon has to make some modifications to allow us to federate. What we're saying is we are making changes only in OpenStack, and that's that's all. If, if there's another cloud, like IBM Cloud, which you want to federate with later, our design should be allow us to federate with IBM Cloud without assuming that IBM Cloud makes any changes at all. So that's the design principle we follow. Uh, so to do this, we use something called the NOAA Cells architecture. 
so this is a new thing which has come in Grizzly. And so earlier on, what used to happen is this is Nova, and the, the Nova used to have a global view. Uh, suppose you have thousand servers in say Bangalore and Chennai and or you know different geographical locations, etc. That would be viewed as one cloud by Nova, by a single Nova. Now Nova has come up with something called Cell, where Cell is a subgrouping. As it, so as the, the Nova doesn't actually define what should be the subgrouping, and you can do it any way you want. So suppose you've got, for example, servers in Bangalore, servers in Chennai, uh, then the Bangalore servers could be one cell, the Chennai servers could be another cell. Or another option is, suppose, for example, you have a data center which has, say, four floors, and each floor is dedicated to a particular department and they own the resources in that floor. So then you can have four cells, each, each floor is a cell. So a cell is simply a grouping of compute hardware resources and OpenStack doesn't define what the cells should be. So the, when, when a request to create a VM comes, it goes to the top cell, which then decides which cell the uh, request should go to. Now the request could be go to the different cells on many criteria. Uh, for example, you can say uh, do it so as to load balance between all the cells. Or you can say do it so that you know requests of a particular type, like creating a database, it goes only to this cell. And uh, say creating a web server goes only to this cell. There may be some reason you want to do it that way. Or you could say that say request of department one, the user one go only to this cell because this is the, for this department and the request go to the other cell. So no one now has a cell architecture, it's like a hierarchical grouping of the hardware resources. So we have leveraged this to make, we have created something called a pseudo child cell, and the pseudo child cell represents the public cloud. Uh, so this is the regular OpenStack cloud, which has two cells. But suppose, for example, you want to federate with Amazon, you created a pseudo child cell, which represents Amazon. Uh, so this pseudo child cell, child cell need to keep track of the resources in Amazon, load in Amazon. So now what happens is when the request comes in, uh, suppose for example you want to uh, uh, you know, uh, spawn a VM in Amazon whenever the load here is too high. If there's peak load here, then I want to spawn a request here. Uh, so then what can happen is you can set a policy in the top cell. Uh, you know, the request first comes to the top cell and top cell will look at the load here. If the load is too high, it will send the request to the pseudo side service in Amazon. Or other ways you can do it is suppose I only want to have the web server here and the database server here because you know database servers contain some critical data which I don't want to move to Amazon. You can you can set a policy here also. In the top side you can say that okay, whenever a request to create a new web server comes, create that new web server in Amazon, but in the database server just send the request down over here. Uh, so some details about how it works, so, you know, the, basically it comes into the Nova parent cell and the child cell and in the pseudo cell we've added code so the pseudo cell can talk to any public cloud. So for example right now in the, in the pseudo cell uh, there are two different kind of pseudo cell, one is an open stack and the second is Amazon EC2. So if a request comes for EC, so the pseudo child cell has two functions. Uh, so first function is of course to create a VM and those kind of things. Uh, so if a request comes in from the top, then uh, what will happen in the uh, in the pseudo cell cell is it will call the Amazon EC2 API to create a VM in EC2. The second thing is the pseudo child cell has to report to the parent cell various statistics about the pseudo child cell, like what is the utilization of each server, you know, those kind of things, statistics. So pseudo child cell does that as well. The Amazon pseudo child cell it will send request to Amazon saying, okay, what's the utilization of each VM that we have, that we have created? What's the total utilization, etc.? And so by that, it, you know, the information gets fed back to the NOVA cell. So this way we got kind of seamless integration of private and public clouds. So uh, basically, the resource of public cloud are used in the same way that the resource of the private cloud are used. Uh, uh, for example, you know, it's easy to say that spawn a VM on the remote cloud when the load on the local cloud is the same. Yeah. Okay, so I'll quickly go over the federated security piece and then we'll have a few questions. So uh, briefly over here, requirement again, the same thing we've been doing the federated security, we've taken the same philosophy that uh, uh, whenever, uh, you know, we, we want to federate the remote cloud, we should make changes only to OpenStack. We should be able to work with any cloud uh, without any modification of the remote cloud. 
so Keystone basically is a security thing which provides identity and access control for, for all the open space resources. And you know this is the way it works. So what I will quickly go over this and I can go in more detail if anybody is interested. Uh, so when a user logs in with the user ID and password, then Keystone, uh, OpenStack has what is called a token based uh, access. So what happens is each user will get a token. It says what are the resources they allowed to access. Uh, so Keystone will send back an unscoped token and a list of resources. Uh, then uh, basically when uh, the user wants to create a VM for example, it sends the create a VM request to Nova and it sends this token. So then Nova takes a look at the token and sees that the user is authorized to create a VM and if he is authorized to create a VM it does that. So that's basically how the OpenStack security works. Uh, so what we have done is we extended this using what we call gateways. Uh, so suppose I want to, uh, uh, suppose this is my local cloud and this is a remote cloud like Amazon or something. Uh, how do I access resources here? So first of all, I'll send a request to my gateway over here saying I want to talk to the remote gateway. So then my gateway will take my token and it will add a field in that saying he is authorized to talk to the remote gateway. Then after that, he sends, uh, I will send the token to the remote gateway uh, saying that I want to access a particular tenant over here, a particular service like no one. So then the gateway will check this and say, okay, are you say are you authorized to create a VM? And then it, it will, if, if you are authorized to do that, uh, it will send uh, the token back saying, okay, you are authorized to do the following operations on the remote cloud. Then after that, you go ahead and you send the request to the remote cloud, and the remote cloud will go ahead and do, it, do the operation. So basically, the, what happens is that the, this gateway is. Uh, sort of certifying you to this gateway saying that, okay, uh, this is a remote user from here. So, uh, I just quickly mention one important thing. So, what is happening if you look at this design at a very high level, uh, this cloud is simply saying, say for example, this is user Dinkar, okay. He is not saying what user Dinkar is authorized to do. A control of what user Dinkar is authorized to do is in this cloud. So, if you look at the high level thing, what happens is this cloud sends a token saying user Dinkar wants to do something. This cloud sends back the token saying, okay, user Dinkar, you're authorized to do the following things. And then when you send the token back, you can only do the things that you're authorized to do. So control of the resource is always over here. But all this person is doing is he's like, it's like he's supplying you with a, a identity card or a driver's license. You take the driver's license, you go here and say, what am I authorized to do? He'll allow you to do so. Uh, so that was it. Uh, hope you enjoyed the talk and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions, uh, time permitting. How many questions do you have time for? So any questions? Sure. So uh, on that uh, federated, uh, while yes. you were introducing that uh, cell, right? Yes. So uh, recently we have seen there is another, uh, on top of that user and project there is a domain. Yes, yes. Right. So yeah. does that actually confirm to this? Uh,